Good evening, everybody. My name is Ethan, and you're watching Pastor Talk. Uh, as you can see, we're in a different location. We're no longer upstairs in the youth room, and uh, we've made a sp space. We've carved out a place here at the church where we can set up a more permanent studio, and we're working on that, so you'll probably see some changes as we go. But our opening question for tonight, we have an opening question, yeah. and that is, what is, has been your favorite childhood vacation? Where, what did you do? Give us some detail. What was your favorite childhood vacation? Um, Pastor, do you have a vacation you want to share with us tonight? Yeah, I've got, well, I'll say this. Uh, my memory is not the best. Before high school, I got hit on the head too many times. But I do remember uh, a vacation. My dad and mom, uh, we lived on a chicken farm, and so you, your schedule, even though we had other businesses and other things going on, your calendar was dictated by those chickens. And so we went, uh, and I don't know how it all worked out, but we went on a vacation, and I might not even be in the right time zone, but uh, we went on a trip up all the way to New York, saw my grandparents up there, they were working on a job up there, went over into, uh, see the Niagara Falls, oh, yeah. and drove up, to, I think, Toronto, and went to the CN Tower there, and then drove across, uh, on the farther west and then come back down and saw um, let's see Mount Rushmore seems like a few there was other things I'm sure but that was a pretty cool vacation that mm -hmm. was a one of those long two-week journeys and that was that was neat of course we've had other small vacations but I don't know that in my growing up I'm I'm 52 born in 68 vacations back in 1971, 72, weren't near as elaborate, nor were mm. they as common as they are now. So we, our vacations might have been to the river to go fishing. Yeah. So, and we did that. We did a lot of those. Uh, you think that river trips. fishing, getting out camping, stuff, that was more common? Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. by far more common. In fact, in fact, we went, there was one time there where we went to the river and went fishing, or maybe it was the lake. And I think we camped there for at least a week, and oh, we wow. weren't we weren't thirty miles from the house. That's nice. But it was it was there, yeah. And everybody was, you know, it was just a neat thing because, um, you know, I think I think if I remember correctly, we had the chicken farm then as well. But my dad could come and go and, and take care of other businesses, and it was it was a neat thing. Yes, yeah. so and we and my and and by the way. Most of our vacations included our grandparents in some sh some way, shape, or form. That's neat. I remember going to Colorado one time, and one of my grandparents, I don't remember which one, had a camper on the back of their truck, one of those that goes over oh, yeah. the top. Cab over camper. And, of course, we didn't wear seat belts, and we didn't care about a lot of things, but the kids rode in the camper, and we were up there on top, and I think my brother got sick. I mean, just... You know, yeah. threw up everywhere and stuff. So that was our vacations, and that was that was a common thing. Mm -hmm. That was, you know, grandparents involved. Everybody went. That was that was pretty common. It was neat. neat. Yeah, yeah, it was great memories, amazing memories. And even though I don't remember all the details, I think a lot of a lot of my character was was built in those things, built during that time period. You know, because. I mean, you'd be up on that camper, and I'm sick. Shut up! <laughs> they wouldn't say shut up, of course. They'd just say, "Ah, oh, you'll handle it." You know, and you just have to get you right. man up, so to speak. Yeah. What about you? What's your favorite? At, like you, I don't have a great memory, but uh, yeah, we're talking about our family vacations right, right now. So if you have a family vacation that you can remember, put that in a comment section. Let us know. Maybe where was your destination? Where did you go? Uh, any funny memories from that? Uh, we're talking about family matters, so something specific to family. Yeah. Uh, where did you go? What did you do? So put that in the comments section. I, I don't remember a lot, but I think the most joy I had uh, traveling was with the RV that we had when I was a kid. Uh, a yep. very old yep. Ford yep. Uh, Class, Class C. C. Yeah. It was the short one, yeah, the short but it did have the Big cab over, they call it, uh, yeah. bed Super up top. Yeah. And uh, you had the complete freedom to be able to uh, move around while we're yeah. driving. And uh, where did we go? Do you remember? I think it had a 454 in it. It got about like six miles a gallon. Yeah, not well at all. I didn't have, I didn't have the money to buy six dollars. It was crazy. But I got a good price on it. We went to Arkansas, 
one time, and then another time I think we went to Missouri, and uh, that was that was really cool. We had a mm-hmm. we had a great time. It was really interesting. I'm trying to remember where we went. I know we went to Arkansas one time. Oklahoma. We went to Oklahoma one time. Okay. We went to um, what's that park up there on the southeast side? Queen, not Queen Wilhelmina. Might have been Queen Wilhelmina. I don't know. Outside of, uh, I'd have to look it up on a map. But that was that was really, uh, that was a neat trip. And, well, anyway, you, you is that your favorite vacation? That, I, I, that the I, only can't, one you remember? I can't remember of any. Um, I, I know, I remember when we went to Disneyland. Yeah. Um, was that Disneyland or Disney World? Disney, Disney, Disney World. World. Disney World. And that was a last minute, literal last minute literal trip. Literal last minute. That and, was like, kids pack up, we're leaving. Uh-huh. And so I remember we lost the dog. No, that was it. That was when we went At to San Antonio point. one time. Okay, yeah, yeah. Time. we were gone. We left it with with yeah. the college student. And, yeah, uh, he lost the dog. We he lost the dog. dog. Yeah, lost we came dog. back. I remember. I do remember being in the hotel room when you found out you yeah. were on the phone. That's right. I, that's one specific thing I can remember. And uh, mom said, "Dog patch" is where we went when you were talking earlier. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. But anyways, um, I. I, I and see, that's kind of disappointing because in my mind, I was thinking that you would say when we went to Colorado and stayed in that old abandoned mine cabin. cabin that, yeah, I remember that, that a little cabin, bit. And we went to Barty Ranch. Mm-hmm. And you know, that I was so young. Old. I was four. No, no. Lane, I mean, Camille was uh, an infant. Okay. Well, maybe you were. I was you six then. Five or seven. Six, six. Yeah. Yeah, you're six. Okay. And. We went to the Barty Ranch, and Barty Ranch is still open, and I saw somebody, some friends of ours out in New Mexico that went up there recently, and they'd say they go up there every year. And that was just, we fixed you up in a little cowboy outfit and let you wear a you know fake pistol, and, mm-hmm. and uh, that was just the neatest thing. We stayed in a cabin that was, I, I got it for free. I, I think I got it free. Now, I might have paid $200 for it, but it didn't have... It didn't have running water, no toilets. They probably just needed somebody to come dust the cobwebs down. <laughs> yeah, it was, is, is, is it was cold. <laughs> we, had, we had blankets piled thick on everybody. And it was uh, outside of, uh, oh my goodness, it was on the west side of Durango, about 20 miles. I forgot the mm-hmm. name of the place. There's a canyon that goes up there. We went up there. Wow. And, uh, and, but, but now one thing, and I don't want to take up too much time, but one thing that we did do as a family intentionally is I personally attempted to every vacation, I wanted every vacation to be different. Mm-hmm. Not going to the same place, doing the same thing. Mm-hmm. Some people like doing that. You know, they have routines. I was going to, this year we're going back to Disney World. I always just thought that I wanted my kids to see as much as they could, to experience as much as they could. Because I just, I don't know. Yeah. No reason. Just well, I, I see here that... Uh, Chris is saying backpacking trip with his dad in California. That's pretty oh, cool. Oh, that would be cool. Uh, yeah. He said just living off of what we had for a few days and hike, hiking back. Weather uh, was amazing, and it was a very awesome experience. I can imagine that would be yeah. a man a great time. We did backpacking, and, and we did yep. some of that uh, yep. in Boy Scouts. Yep. Enjoyed. We did some about five years ago, like to kill me. I yeah, had, uh, in my, Huntsville? Yep. Uh-huh. Yeah. My calf. I I was uh, my, senior, my senior year of high school. I riding a three-wheeler and cut my calf off and I've just had problems ever since but I keep I love to walk I love to run I like to hike but it once you once you overextend that calf or mess that calf up it's you know it's over so I think we hiked what 20 miles 25 miles maybe I don't Almost, know if it was that wasn't part of that might have been 10 10 I might have been 5 <laughs> Well, I, I think we had to stop because we had somebody else with us. That, oh, that it wasn't my fault, was it? No. I forgot about that. So Angie Krager said, My favorite vacations growing up was my grandfather taking us in the RV to different historical places in Texas. We oh. also went to a few beaches. That's neat. Yeah, so tonight we're talking about family matters, and we're reviewing some of our uh, memorable vacations as families. And uh, if you don't have any vacations that you can think of, now is a great time to start a tradition yes, of yes. maybe once a year taking the time and uh, making some experiences with your children, getting out and uh, just having fun. I uh, invest. In, this is one thing me and my wife have talked about: is we'd rather invest in experiences than things. Absolutely. Uh, we can buy toys, we can buy all kinds of things, and you think you satisfy your children, but really comes down to it is experiences yeah. is what really grows well, them. And I would clarify that. I was studying this back when in my, I was in school 
psychology, they, they I read a survey and I come home and told everybody, my family and everybody, experiences with loved ones outrank every other vacation or money mm-hmm. or anything. At the end of the day or at the end of your life, what we value the most is experiences, good experiences mm-hmm. with loved ones. That's why people have bucket lists. Yeah, you know, that's it, right. It's, it's the that's end right. of their life. I wish I could have done these things. That's right. Not, I wish I could have had a garage full of exotic cars or, right. you know, you could have, but a bucket list of experiences. Mm-hmm. And uh, some people wait to the end. I see that in the hospitals where yes. uh, people wait till they're 65 when they're retired and everything's set up perfectly and they have the money in the bank and right. all those things in line or they expect that they would. And then come to find out they get sick or something happens. Yeah. Uh, sadly, it's more often than not that people in the end of life fail. You know, I, I one of my heroes, I would say hero, I don't know if that's the right term, but one of my uh, people that I look up to greatly, and, and, and I would say even a hero, is the Hillies. Benton Hilly, when he was uh, younger, yes. of course he's 75 now or something like that, but uh, when he was younger, he took, he and Tiger, every year they went and hiked uh, yeah. one of the 14ers, what they call mm-hmm. 14ers, in those mountains over 14,000 feet. And I, I forgot how many, I think he said he hiked 17 of them with his son. Wow, that's amazing. That's pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because that, that's kind of one of the, he was just one, he was, maybe he obviously let, was in it before I was there, but that was one of the things that really motivated me because I want to, I want to, not only for the experience, but I want to be there when my kids experience. Mm-hmm. And in fact, uh, we're, we, we need to move on, I'm sure, but taking our grandkids what was it like a week before last? Two weeks ago. Mm-hmm. Two weeks ago to Yellowstone was one of those things that I'll never forget. Ten days <laughs> in a car. <laughs> three, a three year old and eight month old. I'll never forget it. But uh, I'm sure yeah, the eight month old will probably never remember that. But three year old was just like mesmerized and everything. Of course, your daughter, Lainey, she's everything. You show her this, wow. Right. You look, hey, look at this, wow. <laughs> You know, so she's a she's a joy to have on a vacation. Those were good kids too. They were just amazing. But um, that was really neat. That wasn't Yellowstone was on my bucket list. Uh-huh. I didn't even think about taking the grandbabies until my wife says we're not going without them. So <laughs> right. So I had to take them. But anyway, you took lots of pictures. That was lots great. of pictures. Right. Tons and now pictures. we have no excuse. Whereas before, pictures can fade right. and get old, right. and, and you lose them and. Uh, damage to them one way or another. Nowadays, you're able to store these things and yeah. have memories, and yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's an amazing thing. Yeah. So I think, I think you do need to print some off every once in a while. Though. Yes, definitely. I think there should be hard, hard copies. drives. Hard drives mm-hmm. are not always perfect. Right. You need to have duplicates. You got to spend some effort into that kind of stuff. Right. Let's talk about our stuff. Okay. So tonight we're talking. The title is Family Matters, and we're going to basically go into why the family matters. This is something that. Our world is attempting to dissolve, and um, we're at a point where we have to stand our ground on certain things. And uh, we've talked about other issues, yeah. but I think we need to talk about the family and why we need to stand our ground, if not do more for the families yeah. than ever before. Yeah. And, and, and also define what a biblical family is. So at the end of this, we're going to come out with an understanding of what the biblical foundation definition. of definition of the family is. And so uh, why don't you in the comment section, give us your idea of what a family is. <laughs> Let, let's get it going. So we, we want you commenting. We, we want you all typing away. So what do you define a family as? And uh, hopefully we're going to be clear enough as to what the biblical definition of the family is. And so pastor, why don't you lead us into this and uh, could you maybe give us some background as to why we should be defending this? Well, first of all, and, and I think you kind of alluded to it, the, the family is the nucleus, the, the building blocks the core. of civilization, of society. It's always been that way, and it will continue to be that way no matter what people say, no matter what researchers say, no matter what people think. The family will be the the building blocks of a civilized society. And so, obviously, the, the reasons for that is multiplied, thousands of reasons, but there's some basic principles 
we know that uh, uh, in in that family there should be loyalty. Right. There should be education or influence to 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 educate the next generation, and it's not you know now we've got this Google and, and internet and stuff, and we're like removing the influence of our elders. There's no need that, for wisdom anymore. Right. right. It's just At knowledge. least we think so. Yeah. It's just knowledge instead of wisdom. Right. And then there's also that procreative uh, part of marriage that brings a child into psychologically, and I know there's more things than just psycho stuff, but psychologically it brings a child into a loving, caring, secure environment that uh, they know my mom, my dad, my siblings, and they're on my side. That, and it just That's just a few. I'm sure our commenters here, our people that are watching this, there, there's multitude more very important reasons for the family, but you can't build, you know, teaching, teaching loyalty, mm -hmm. teaching uh, unity later in life. Character in general. Just character in general. Yeah. That's almost impossible because that is, those are character traits that are built within the first five to seven years of your life. Right. And if they don't understand the joy of a home that is at peace with one another or that is, uh, you know, loyal, taking up for one another, even when they fight, even when, you know, how you are with siblings, mm -hmm. even when you fight, even when you argue, you're still, you still have an obligation to love one another. Right. And that teaches us so many things. But the family has obviously been bombarded, and we have brought up over the last uh, five, six months many issues that have bombarded the family. And part of those things that are, Bombarding the family does have to do with finances and uh, you know COVID and other diseases and other situations that are coming along. But but uh, and then I will I'll bring some more of those up in a minute because there are some that are very very important that uh, if we don't if we don't understand what's going on, the family is being destroyed. I'll I'll throw this out there and I have this somewhere on a statistic and and I've got four or five research papers that that uh, I've used tonight to come up with some of these things and I'm not going to try to pull them up because I'm not able but we do know that prior to the 1950s uh, marriage was I mean like if you were together and had children it was like a 95% chance you were married and then after World War II of course I said 50s but after World War II things uh, money began to be more free uh, um, I say free, but America was growing and prospering. They had to get through some tough years there. But then come along the 60s. And the there's three things I believe that took place in that time period that have hurt, truly hurt the family. Number one is the uh, the hippie generation, that, that rebellious generation. Free love, that was part of it. You know, everybody just shack up and do what you want and have kids and that kid can be mine and yours and hers and all at the same time. Number one. Number two was the removing America off of the gold standard in 1971. And then number three, which was actually prior to that, uh, and in fact it was prior to the hippie generation in fact, is in 1963, Lyndon B. Johnson signed um, legislation that basically gave us our new welfare system. They called it the Great Society. And not everything about the Great Society was bad, but it really took the importance of that nuclear family away and it gave it to the government. And so that was really, uh, it really hurt the families because, in, 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 let me tell you why. Only part of, again, I'm gonna repeat myself, only part of the grand of, of the great society was bad. I guess the only part was good as well. But this is what was the war on poverty. The war on poverty that obviously brought out the welfare system as we know it today. And when they did that, it uh, punished. Or let me re go the other way around. It uh, uh, blessed single parenthood more than married parenthood. It redefined what we call poverty or living in poverty or poor. 
It redefined a lot of things. And so a woman, and I'm only, I'm not trying to put my finger in somebody's eye, but a woman could have three or four kids claim that she did not know the daddy and make more money and the daddy could still live in the home, but they weren't, they weren't married. Right. So it created a paradigm, a false paradigm in, in the children, a false perspective, if you will, in the children of the home. And of course it evolved or we, we can all devolved out of that to where the daddy didn't just stay in the home, even though he wasn't married, but eventually he wasn't married, didn't stay in the home, didn't have to, because what's it matter? She, she got the government, she got the money. I don't even have to be there. And then because of drugs, the, the psychedelic drugs started all off, but you know, LSD and, and pot, and then it went on. And I'm, I'm doing a lot of talking, but these are, these are my years. Mm -hmm. Of course, I'm 168, but this is, I've seen this happen. And of course, I was raised in the church. And so divorce was always frowned upon. Living, living together, or what we used to call shacking up, was always frowned upon. But it just got worse and worse and worse. And again, like I said, what, another ingredient here that I'm throwing in there. When Kennedy, excuse me, Nixon took us off the gold standard and they began to manipulate the inflation rate. Uh, what in 1971 is when that took place. From 71 on, inflation has di uh, uh, directly hurt the poor families more than anybody else. Wow. It, it, they stand out as being the most impacted by inflation. The, the government says inflation is 3%, period. Okay, let's just say 3%. I'm putting a, putting a, a, making that a common number because that's kind of the average. But real inflation has hurt our income. And we were talking about it earlier. $20 an hour today is not the same thing as $20 an hour 20 years ago. Right. Why is that? Because inflation has, it makes everything we need cost more and everything we make worth less. Right. So that, that chasm between what, how much you work and how much you can afford grows bigger and bigger and bigger every year. And that's why when my wife and I got married at, in 1988, um, it, was, it, was, it was an admirable thing for a young man to work and provide for his family, but it was almost impossible. It was hard mm -hmm. then. It, every year, 32 years now, it's gotten harder and harder. And that what the government says is 3% is not 3%. It's, it's magnified and exacerbated by all the other issues in our life. We are more attuned to our health. We have to go to the doctor more. Right. All the time we go to the doctor. Well, health healthcare is cheap. Healthcare is more expensive. Mm -hmm. Healthcare is a is a an industry that we never saw. I mean, I'm gonna say um, when when I was a kid, let me put it to you this way. When I was a kid, if you broke your finger, you broke your finger, they you know put it in a strap or whatever, and that was about it. Splint it. Splint, not strap, splint. You know, you cut yourself, you, you you put duct tape on it or whatever, right. and you moved on. Of course, when I got chewed up by a dog, I went to the doctor, went to the ER, and they fixed me up and all that kind of stuff. But now we go to the, we get we get a cold, we sneeze, and we have to go to the, co to the doctor. So we we have all these which our needs. foods are worse too now. So foods are our, worse. I was reading Joe Salatin was saying yes. how yes. food prices have gone down. But our quality. food quality has, has gone down dramatically, yes. and our health costs have shot, shot up, up because of that. So our di right. diabetics, there are so many more diabetics. Right. So many we don't eat health related. We don't eat vegetables and meat anymore. Right. Mm -hmm. And if we do eat vegetables and meat, we gotta have a lot of sugar mm -hmm. and a lot of other things. We gotta have a lot of carbs. So know? it 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 brings us to visiting hospitals more and mm -hmm. higher prices and all that. Yeah, so. and, and poverty, the poverty, and, and I, I keep going on back to poverty. We're talking about families in general, but um, and, and what we, I'm going to use the common definition of poverty, and that is the lower 20%. Uh, the lower 20% is poverty, the upper 20% is wealthy, and then the middle 60% is what they call middle class. That's yeah. gen generic. 
But that lower 20%, man, they are getting beat up. And they're, like you said, they're eating foods that are worse for them, but they're cheaper and they can afford them. Yeah. And men are having to work two and three jobs. Women are, you know, you get the man and the woman working together. Two incomes are necessary it, now. It creates, yeah, it, your schedules are sometimes not on the same level. So you're not getting sleep as much as well. You don't well. sleep as well. The kids don't see the parents at the dinner table. Mm -hmm. At the same time, you don't have family discussions. Mm -hmm. Internet is involved. Right. You know, Facebook, all this. I, we met, I'll never forget this. It's like, I don't know why, but it's like branded into my mind. When uh, about seven or eight years ago, maybe nine years ago, it was the first time I realized, wow, this is huge. We went to, what's that chicken place? Wings and More on the mm -hmm. south side of town. Sat down. I think it was I think it was my wife and I and maybe Camille with me. And I sat down. I always have my back to the wall and I can see the door and stuff. This family walked in. I'm paranoid. Not really. But this family walked in. There was like four kids, maybe five. I can't remember. Mom and dad and three or four or five kids, whatever it was. Every, she set them in their chair, and they ranged probably from three years old to probably nine. She got everybody to sit in their chairs, and she gave out tablets tablets, and, and cell phones to each one of them. Yeah, yeah. The whole meal they stayed on, mm -hmm. they were eating like this. And I was like, wow, this is crazy. So families in general have a... There, it, I, I'm going to say it this way. If a man and a woman can get married, stay married, and raise good kids in today's society, it is going to be intentional. Right. It has to be. It will not be. It's not just going to happen. Right. You're going to have to be very intentional about what you allow in your home, what you eat. I mean, everything. How big a house you buy. And that's another thing. Right. Our comp our com Competitive Keep nature. Keep up with Joneses, yeah. Every year, the square footage of houses, the average square footage of houses get higher and higher and higher. Mm -hmm. But, but the, the number of children in households is dropping. Dropping. So the rooms necessary is, or is not so high, yeah. but yeah. you got to have it. Yeah. Wow. Well, a three-bedroom, When again, when I was a kid, of course, and, and I know we can't stay where I was a kid, but when I was a kid, Back in my you day. Know, it was three bedrooms, one bath. Oh, wow. Parents, everybody shared the same Everybody shared a bathroom. bathroom. Wow. Then it went to two baths. Then, you know, and now we're, you know, according to which which uh, country yeah. you're in, which city you're in, all that. Western varies. culture, everyone has to have their own shower, their own right. sink. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can't share. Right. So the the family has been bombarded. And yeah. I think, uh, and we can revisit some of these things that I've just referred to, but I think the family is being bombarded on every way. COVID is making changes, and I know that we think, well, we it's not even on our it's not even on our radar. COVID's not on our family radar, but it really is, and I'll explain that more in a minute. But I think our families that are watching this need to recognize up front you're they're gonna have to be intentional. Right. If they're not I talked to a, I talked to a man today. I'm not gonna say names and all that kind of stuff, but I'm telling you what he has been a fantastic daddy, mm -hmm. fantastic daddy, and he made he made living for God fun, right? And he everything they did was family oriented, and he was very intentional about raising his family. And now he's starting to reap the rewards of that. Mm -hmm. If we could just see. Our five-year-old, fifteen years from now, our three-year-old, seventeen yeah. years from now. It's scary. It's it's. But exciting. It can be scary, but can also be super rewarding, to have that young lady or that young child, that young man, seventeen, twenty years from now, marry into a good home, and they're happy, and they're you know and. I'm, I foresee, I'm not saying that it's going to happen right away. I don't think it's something like that. But I foresee that if our economy continues to struggle, and right now it's got some hiccups going on. Nobody knows what's right. going on. Gold's pulled back. Silver's pulled back. Stock market went up. Oil dropped. Payment deferments and things like that. Oh, you kind of pacifies the moment. Exactly. Right. But I predict 
that the day will come when our economy will literally crumble beneath our feet and we'll be wondering how we're going to pay our bills. Family. When that happens, exactly. When that happens, you're going to see this disconnected family. Mm -hmm. It's either going to fall apart, but the good ones are going to say, let's come together. Successful will be the ones with the family, with the... With the, with the most mm-hmm. adaptable home life and, right. and willing to work together. But I, I really do. I'm not, and Lord knows God's coming back. I have no doubt about that. And I pray that it happens before the collapse of the economy. Right. But I don't think it will. That's just, I'm not planning for that. Yeah. I'm planning for the, the collapse of the economy. And I'm talking about the world economy to be a mm-hmm. part of the end time. Yeah, I think that's what's going to be part of that foundation for the end time. Mm-hmm. So I look at it and say, okay, as the the elder, which is really weird, getting old, as the elder in our family, in my family, I've got to take care of things today, so I'll be ready for them. Right, and that includes about seventy five or eighty percent of my effort. And I don't even know why I said that. Probably ninety nine point nine percent of my effort physically is so I can have my family right. Right. Almost all my effort, and I'm, I'm thinking out loud here, but I can't think of anything I'm doing that doesn't have some roundabout way to bless my, my family. Yeah. And I would say one of our greatest responsibilities as parents or as any kind of familiar leader uh, is for your family. Yes. And, and, and that's got to be our greatest responsibility. Yes. And uh, uh, Absolutely. I know Scripture speaks to issues of the family. It did not neglect it. That's one thing. Oh, no, no. There it's is, not something that was an afterthought. It was actually used as a structure to base principles, even biblical principles, out of. Well, and, and we were going to we were gonna do it at the end. Uh, and was, I'm going to say do it. We were going to quote it at the end. But Ephesians 5 talks about mm-hmm. the responsibility of the husband, the wife, and the children. And there is a flowing down of authority a flowing up of submission. There's mm-hmm. also a flowing down of blessings. Yeah. I mean, there's... And a, patience. It's <laughs> constantly doing this yeah. all the way throughout the... But all of that is based on the principle of all of us, and the man has to lead it in the typical home. And I'm saying typical. I want to make sure everybody understands this. I'm talking biblical definition of a family. By the way, what is a family? I know many of them are scared to put that in the comment section out of fear of being wrong. But uh, what would you define a family as being? Uh, is this a man and woman? Is this, I know this, this is what's crazy is we're in 2020 when the world is questioning the definition of family. Christopher to Daniel, the point. Go ahead. He said, he said Alistair Crowley said that the family is, is, the family is enemy number one. It is. But under, it's been that the family is enemy number one. It's been right. under systematic attack for years. The family traditionally goes hand in hand with the church, church and elders. It does. It, is. it does. That's right. Mm-hmm. And they, she said, Alistair Crowley, and I'm trying to remember, she's not the, she's not the one. Daniel, tell me who Alistair Crowley is. I know the name. She's not, she's not Planned Parenthood. But I can't remember what she, her her uh, role is in life. It's a it's a man. Is it a man? Uh, let's see. He's looking it up. We don't have our system set up the way we should, I don't think, right now. We're working on it, though. But I do, I think you're right. I think that if, if we aren't intentional about raising our families and about bringing them up in a God-fearing home, and I'm, when, I, when we talk about God-fearing home, we're talking about a home that submits itself to the biblical definitions and one of the things, in fact, I said this earlier, on um, the Great Society, they had to redefine what poverty meant. They had to redefine a family. And so they took it out of the biblical context, which it had been forever. Mm-hmm. They took it out of that context in 1963 and redefined everything. He is a dude. He's oh, a yeah, the Book too. of Satan. The Book of Satan. Yep. And yeah, that's their won. goal. He thinks it's enemy number one. So there, and that is that is by far. I look at Planned Parenthood. All the the woman right. and I forgot her name. You remember? It? Yeah. <laughs> that is looking up again. Uh, uh, but the woman that started Planned Parenthood was all about birth. Um, no, not birth control, but 
but demographic control. She did not want uh, more blacks. Margaret Sanger. Yeah. Sanger. That's it. And what's crazy? She was a, a open racist. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. But she was anti-family as well. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, and that's one of the things that we. I think we can, if we're looking at it with open eyes, and I know that this is kind of a heavy topic that people don't want to hear, but this is a really important topic. If we look at this, our world situation with open eyes, the hippies of the 50s and 60s are now the leaders of today. They're the greatest authorities. They're the professors. They're right. the doctors. They're the, they're the politicians. Well, the fringe ideologies made themselves... Part That's of the right. academia to That's the right. point where they are now propagating their yeah, we're ideology. Abnormal. Yeah. Even though we look at traditional the Bible, marriage is abnormal. Abnormal. Mm -hmm. That's right. And I think that, that that is going to continue to be the case. There are going to be exceptions, and that is because we have had, thankfully, and I wish that I would have been this person, but we have thankfully had a few people in their younger years say, I'm going to grow up, I'm going to get a degree, mm -hmm. and I'm going to be a politician. I want to influence our country for the better. And there are, thankfully, and that, I believe, honestly, I believe that is part of the contest between the progressive and the mm -hmm. conservative right. agendas. I think uh, we have to take a stand on some things. And I, I know some people like to harp on politicians to the point where, uh, yeah, <laughs> don't tread on me. Don't that was a birthday gift, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But they like to harp on politicians, and all politicians are bad. They're all corrupt, and they just put this blanket statement out there just because they want to say something mm -hmm. that's, mm -hmm. I don't know, polarizing maybe. Yeah. And, and you could say that maybe to some extent that may be true, but at the same time, I do believe that God can place people in positions of power Absolutely. on purpose. Absolutely. Do you not believe God can do that? Right. If you did, then you wouldn't be saying that all oh. these people are terrible. Well, and that's like all cops are, well, they don't say bad, but right. all ACAB. That's not true. Right. That's the widest brush that you can paint with. Uh -huh. And it's... it's leave, God, leave God some room to work. Right. Don't, don't be painting everything with such a broad brush. That's right. I think that, I, but I do believe that, that and, and I think that it's still important that our young people and our, our younger people, mm -hmm. those that are still in school, you know, there's nothing wrong with getting a, an education in political science. Right. Or uh, political science and history. Or go another direction and then go in politics. Right. <laughs> Maybe that's right. better. <laughs> right. And for those of you that don't know this, I'll just go ahead and tell you, and I, I, it's an old statistic, probably 10 years old, but uh, most lawyers loved history and got a history degree mm -hmm. that led them to law. Right. So you can love history. You can say, oh, I love history, but it don't make any money. You could be a politician. Yeah, well, where not? Nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you go into the military, you get your degree, you do whatever else. There's a lot of combinations. Mm -hmm. But I think the family is being bombarded because we have let that fringe element take such a lead role for so long. Now they're not the fringe. Right. We've allowed it. What you've tolerated, yeah. what was the sequence of events? Oh, man, I uh, wrote it down years ago. But what we tolerate, we eventually embrace. And what we eventually embrace, uh, no, it's the other way around. We, yeah, something like that. Right. I, it's like three steps, four steps. Mm -hmm. Wrote it down about 10 years ago. But, yeah, what we tolerate, we eventually embrace. And what we embrace, we eventually Promote, partake in. Partake in. That's yeah. it. And okay. that's, that is on anything, by the way. That is... When you, what you allow way, in your home and it just yes mm -hmm. and, and you know one of the things with families that are really we have an addiction I'm not talking about an internet, internet addiction right but we have an addiction to remain busy to stay busy yeah and if we're busy then you need to be busy and as a parent if I'm working on something or if I'm watching a YouTube video, then you need to be out of my hair so I can watch this video. So you need an internet device. Oh, wow, yeah. And we are pushing that, and now we've created this cycle, and it is truly already a cycle, even though it's only 10 years old. Mm -hmm. But it is a cycle that if we don't stop it intentionally, I keep using that word tonight, uh, our families are going to uh, really suffer 10 years from now, 15 yeah. years from now. 
and it won't take long. Well, the greatest influence, and one, one sign of understanding who's influencing kids is maybe what they want to be when they grow up. Used yeah. to, they would uh, look at their parents or grandparents, and they see their careers, and they say, wow, he was a great fireman. He was what, that's, that's what I want to be. Right. Well, you look in 2018, 2019, you see that one of the top choices for what people, kids want to be mm-hmm. is an inter- internet vlogger, a video vlogger. Because that is their influence. Not that they're exposed to their parents' careers, but that they're only exposed to the internet. And that is what influenced them to a career that has nothing to do, that they've never done anything with. Yep. And, and so that, that just shows yep. who's influencing. They want to be an Instagram star. Right. And there can only, I mean, it, it's like a water hose. There can only, I mean. Influencer. I think that's what it is. That, that's the social term. Influencer. Social influencer. And there can only be so many. Yeah. Who are you going to influence if everyone? <laughs> and who's going to? And the thing is, they're doing greater and crazier things to bring attention to themselves, so they will have the most influence. Right. I mean, they're doing well, radical, crazy. Things. Yeah, exactly. They have to go to the next level to get the yeah. dopamine. Dopamine. They've got to impress right. the crowds, or else they lose money. Right. And if they don't do that crazy, outlandish thing, then they lose their whole career. They lose viewers. They lose, and it just, it just. Mm-hmm. Cycles down the line. Yeah, so they're it's pushed to do the outlandish, to do the things that's not expected, and even immoral. Because we're starting to see some influencers who have uh, just say that some of them were involved with the riots that have been going on. You see some of them that have gone out and just gone to the extreme because that's what they're used to doing. Yeah, they're fed that social influence drug constantly. Yeah. Yeah. So, anyways, we we probably need to move on, but. Yeah. I'm not even keeping up with the time. I'll tell you, I'm either, but Wayne Evans uh, said he said he would sure love. And now I'm, I'm being respectful here, but Wayne Evans is one of our elders in the church. He said he would sure love to see more strong Christians in political right. government. Yeah, and he he's right. But it was his age. Now I'm saying he was might not have been a hippie, but he was in that era. <laughs> yeah, because I was born in '68, mm-hmm. and that was kind of the peak of the hippie era. Mm-hmm. It started. And he might even correct me on this, but I'm thinking it started in 62, 63, uh, and then it went to about 73, 74. Mm-hmm. Basically, that Vietnam era, uh, maybe not whole because it was a little bit overlapped, but he would know, Wayne Evans would know more about that than I would. Yeah. It is, it's crazy at how we allow them to be as, as influential into our systems as they are. Mm-hmm. But it is. And and if we don't if we don't change our expectations of ourselves, if we don't change the expectations we have of our families, and this is something this is, you know, and this is I think where maturity comes in. You you know a child is mature or a person is mature when they start taking responsibility for their own actions, mm-hmm. instead of blaming the dog ate my homework or my brother didn't help me clean the room. They look at you and say, I didn't do it, and I got distracted, or I didn't do it, and it was my fault. Yeah. That's a, a, a sign right there. It's somebody maturing. A, fa- a family man, a family woman, should not have to be reminded on a weekly or monthly or a yearly basis even that this has got to be their property. Yeah, It can't be something that the pastor or whoever else you take your influence from stands up and says, bless God, we're for families. It's like, come on, that should be something that you personally take, you know, and, and that's your priority. Mm-hmm. I am a family man, period. Yeah. Let me throw you some other things out here. Just don't know. Go ahead. Stuff yeah, just go. popped in my mind. Another issue that came up, like I said, in the 50s, and I, I didn't, this is not on my notes, but it's very important. In the World War II, a lot of our women went to work in the market right. and workplace. Mm-hmm. That put, for lack of better words, a lot of women and a lot of men working in the same workplace. Women that prior to the end stayed home, took care of the children, the men stayed at work. Okay, World War II forced us to make some changes. Those changes are similar to what's happening now, by the way. COVID is a generational de- defining mm-hmm. event. Yeah. And it will define it will modify our future. It, it, it already has, and it will continue to do so. Mm-hmm. But the, World War II was one of those things that just clashed with what we expected of ourselves 
clashed with what was a norm. Then, when World War II was over, a lot of the women, most of them, did go back to the home, but they felt that freedom and that, I'm going to say liberation, and I'm not trying to be uh, rude here, but they did feel that liberation. I can send the kids to daycare. I can send the kids to somebody else. I can, the kids are school. I've got town lands. I can do what I want to. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, that created a environment of uh, what was what's, what's the right word? There's a technical word that where they could run around on their spouse easier. Adulterous. Adulterous. Yeah, you you right word. I think I think it's a word. <laughs> but yeah, it created an environment to where men could, even if it was an emotional affair. Mm -hmm. You know, a woman. Well, they put aside their they put aside their responsibilities of raising children, of doing certain yes. things that were expected. Where now those expectations are now lowered to where now they have the ability to be less dependent on one another as a as a husband and wife. Right, emotionally, mm -hmm. physically, financially, spiritually, everything they are less mm -hmm. dependent upon yeah. each other. And social media is is that is same. a second wave right. of that same thing. Mm -hmm. I can have, I can have a connection, and, and if and of course I don't. But if I could, if I I could, mm -hmm. I could probably have connections with. Uh, I'm thinking of Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and I know there's others, but that's the three that I know of. But you can have connections with old girlfriends mm -hmm. or whatever else, and run around on your spouse emotionally, right? Sexually. Mm -hmm. And it leads that those the problem with that is it leads to things that are they become a reality. Well, it leads to what we've looked at earlier as far as the graphs and, and the degradation of the family. Yes, and that's exactly what it reflects. Yeah. yeah, let me let me throw some numbers out here for you, and I'm going to do this off the top of my head because I'm keeping up with the comments. But um, back before at World War II, let's just say it that way. World War II, the Rate of marriage was 12, around 12 and up per thousand. 12 people per thousand got mm -hmm. married every year. That was a consistent, and that kept the marriage percentage up there at that 90% rate mm -hmm. because somebody's always getting married. And if you weren't one of those this year, next year you would be. And so mm -hmm. it was constantly this marriage rate of 12 per thousand. A little bit over that, but that's general. Every at, at every um, major catastrophe, uh, the Great Depression, World War II, World War One, um, Vietnam War, that that mar marriage rate took a hit. Right, and it got down to at the end of the Vietnam War something like six point five, no six point nine, I think it is. In two thousand and eight. It was 6.5, the lowest we've ever had. And now uh, the sociologists are coming out and saying COVID, they're seeing signs that COVID has lowered it even more. Wow. So what was bad, we think is normal. What was horrible. Right. And we know it's like the birth rate of a country. We know the demographics, if... Two people, on average, have less than 2.1 children on average. There is no growth. It's it's dying. The right. generation's dying. That that mm -hmm. whatever it is, if it's if you if you want not to say sustainable by color, after a yeah, generation, it's basically. not sustaining life. You got to have more than 2.1. Mm -hmm. But what we know is, and and this can be read in a book I read many years ago, um, America Alone, and okay. I forgot the name of the guy's name. Levin, Mark yeah. Levin, a lot of statistics in it, but a very good book. Oh, eye-opening book. But we know, and this was 10, 15 years ago, that like Muslims are having 8, 9, 10 kids per, I think their average is like 7.9, if I remember correctly. Wow. It was way jacked up there. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. Hispanics are having like, back in the day, this is 15 years ago, they have like five, fa five children per kids, per, five children per family. Uh, Christians in general we're having less than Muslims. And, and color didn't really matter. There is, the fact is that the family, we cannot live for ourselves and expect 
to be anybody 30, 40 years from now. Right. You, and that's the reason why, and, and even though it's it's one of those things that we don't talk about, we don't think about it, that's the reason why three kids were like, oh, you've got the perfect little family. You had, you had one, if one got, if you decided to kill one, you still had two. <laughs> yeah. You know, I've been, I, actually, that's probably not something good I'd say, but, but you could, if you lost one, or if anything happened, you still had that other, that other child. So you could still propagate, you could still have children, and right. their children, and their children, but you have to keep having three kids. Yeah. On average, or 2.1 on average. But that is, thing, these are things that people don't typically think about and but demographics is massive. It, yeah. In fact, when you look at the church, even demographics is everything. Right. Uh, I'll, I'll give an example. Give you a couple of examples. We live in College Station. Average age this ten years ago, five years ago it was twenty six. I'm making that up. You can look it up on Wikipedia or something. Twenty six. If our average age at the church is older than twenty six. We're dying. Mm. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Right. It's scary so because we, we to, claim that's a young number. Right. Most churches would brag about that number. Oh yeah, right. <laughs> but we can't brag about that. It's, every church is a little different. Right. If you're in a, if you're in some you know outback place and the average age is 45 and your church is averaging 42, then you're doing pretty good. Right. You're not doing bad. You're not doing great, but you're not doing bad. Uh, but if it's 56. You're dying. You just don't know it yet. Yeah, you're on life support, mm -hmm. and uh, so so demographics is everything, and it's and it's about reproduction. It's not about you know bringing in people. It's about about winning new souls and stuff. So anyway, that yeah. I'm way off topic. But the family unit, in every way, shape, and form, is the building blocks of a society, including the church. And maybe yes. I can blend it together there. Yeah. That worked. <laughs> you brought it together good. Yeah. So I, I just think that, that our viewers have got to see the importance right. of the family unit. Mm -hmm. COVID is taking a lot of inhibitions that we, you know, and, and it's incremental. If it's hard, it's, as, a, as a pastor, it's hard to preach against familiar sin. I say that based on, mm -hmm. let's just say, for instance, my son come up and he did something that was unbiblical. Well, you know, I don't want to preach against my son. He's my son. Too close. Too close. Mm -hmm. Familiar sin. So what we do is we allow it to slip by. Yeah. What happens to the next generation? They don't just allow it to slip by. Well, they, they bring actually, other things plus they that embraced closer. It. Mm -hmm. they embraced it. And what you did that was unbiblical mm -hmm. becomes acceptable. Yeah. And then the next generation is embraced. embraced. So the family unit, the mom and the dad, must be very committed to standing for what is absolutely right. Yeah. Don't add to it. Don't take away from it. But be biblical. And mm -hmm. if they are, uh, then I think that... And, and there's... Unfortunately, and I just said that, it just come to my mind... A lot of people out there that don't know what's in the Bible. <laughs> you know, they just don't know what's in the Bible. They don't realize mm -hmm. the Bible says that. And they don't infer if, like for instance, if me, if I was to stay, if my wife made, oh, mm, my wife made two things today. Goulash. <laughs> goulash. Banana nut bread. Which was not so successful. But banana nut bread wasn't terrible. I'm not yeah, saying it, was, it wasn't bad. It was good. <laughs> but she also made banana nut bread, and she made a mistake. And I don't know what she made a mistake on. Too much sugar or what? And I don't know. <laughs> but it fell flat, and it was a bunch of hard crust. And all that crust was amazing. I need it all, but that was amazing. But if I tell my wife, and, it, and by the way, maybe if you're watching, I love you, <laughs> so don't worry about it. But if I told my wife. It's not yours, apparently. If I said, you know, I could just turn my nose up. She said, hey, do you want an extra? If as simple as this, do you want an extra helping? Nah, it's okay. She, by inference, she knows that I didn't really like it that much. See what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And God does a lot of things like that throughout the Bible. He, we, Scripture tells us that, uh, I believe it was, it was, um, let me think. I probably should have wrote this down. One of, I think it was Moses, 
Moses learned the will of God, the ways of God, from God himself. Well, if we want to know the ways of God, we've got to look at the Bible. But we also can look at the ways of God. Mm -hmm. And um, I think families, Ephesians chapter 5, we, like I said earlier, it talks about the families and how important they are and how they work together. Right. And I love that you brought up somebody earlier of how they made Living for God fun. I think that's a great mm -hmm. thing that we need to be doing. Yes. Um, don't just make it part of your life. Right. But make it all your life. Uh, and, and, and try to find out what your kids are influenced by. That's something that I'm always amazed how Lainey, three and a half years old, what influences her? Where does she learn these things? She's, she says things from Graham all the time. She came home and I don't know what she said, but it was, I, I forgot, but it was something that, yeah. what Graham would have said. Yeah. Yeah. She said word for word, expressed it the same way. And I said, oh my God. She's been, around she's been around Graham, right. and uh, but and it, but say if it's a show that she's watching, things like that, she'll pick it up. She's gonna pick it she's up. A sponge. Yes. Until they're 15 years old, they're like little sponges. They're just right. sucking it all in. Yeah. And what we allow to be in front of them, and what we make important. I, again, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw this out there because it's just so important. I wrestled with this, and I'm gonna kind of not be confessional here, but I'm gonna be very blunt. I wrestled with mistakes I made as a young pastor. And I realized about three years ago the mistake I made, or the biggest mistake I made. And I wished I could correct it, but I can't. Mm. But I can go forward with it. Right? Right. But I realized three or four years ago, yeah, I'll just not say all that. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. More to come, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll say it later. Yeah, and you learn as you go, and you can't be too big or strong or too much yeah. of an authority to the point where you can't admit um, wrong or can't admit that you know I, maybe I need to make changes. Because yeah. what you do is uh, I I can't remember who I read this from, but they were basically saying if you can't admit it, your kids will never do the same. Uh, if if you yell at your child, if you can't apologize to your child later, then your child's going to have that same mentality growing up, and it just goes generation. It, it is, it is uh, cyclical. It mm -hmm. is, and I forget the exact term, but there's a term that, right. and it is. You, but, but you know, thankfully you have a mom and a dad, and they uh -huh. balance that bird, you know, with two mm -hmm. wings. They balance it out. And it flies, but eventually we have to let go of our children. And in today's world, you really want your children to hold. And I know that I'm pretty radical about this stuff, and I, but I, I'm, I'm also pretty much in the Bible, so I don't feel too bad about it. But you have to hold a higher standard in your own life than what actually is required. Mm -hmm. And you really need to hold your own children to a standard higher than that, not higher than you, but higher as well, because they're eventually, unless their character is extraordinary. They're eventually going to slowly lower their own standard. Mm -hmm. When they get out, when they get out of the house, they're going to lower their standard. Now, like me, got out of the house, lowered my standard, fell flat on my face, got back up, raised my standard back up, and it was a whole new world. Yeah. But um, make living for God. You, you younger people, will listen to me. You listen to me. Make living for God fun. Make going to the church fun. Right. Make get make going to the Sunday school fun. Don't talk about the pastor. I mean, you talk <laughs> about him to yourself and your wife in a closed room in the dark or something. But don't don't talk about the Sunday school don't teacher. Don't talk about mm -hmm. problems. Make living for God fun. Make your spouse in your mind and your heart, no matter what. No matter what, nothing matters. Make him or her in your mind and your heart your passion, your mm -hmm. greatest desire. And those the combination of those two things, right? It is just amazing. Yeah. Amazing Can't help but be aspect. successful. Right. Well, you know, you yeah. said it earlier. You, you go ahead and say it. The three ingredients. Yeah. If you want to be successful in yeah. America, you uh, what is it? You graduate, graduate, high, school. graduate high school, wait to have killed kids so after you're married. Right. And get a job. And get a job. Those three things. Three things. If you do those three things mm -hmm. in America, you'll have eventually 
Mm-hmm. You'll have savings. Mm-hmm. You'll have a home. You'll have, you know, and if you just do those things. Divorce is super costly. Oh, now, yeah. I know they well, in many ways. Mm-hmm. Yeah, more than just the cost of the lawyer. Right. The cost of the lawyer is getting cheap. In fact, you go down to Houston. What is it down in Houston? I saw that billboard down there. It said, hotel. One, this is years ago. Mom and I were driving down the road. And I think it was on our anniversary. I mean, our, our wedding, honeymoon. And we just spent the night on our honeymoon. This is back in the day, $189 a night. We get in the car. We're headed down the road. And there's one that's like $129 a night. It's tempting. And it's like, oh, we could have stayed there last night. And then it was like 100 a night. And we got down the closer we got to downtown Houston, nine ninety five an hour. Oh my goodness, that's <laughs> terrible. Like, yeah, it was horrible. <laughs> and it was just you just cheapen things. Right. It just gets cheaper mm-hmm. and cheaper, and you just you just gotta hold that standard up there. And the thing is, divorce has gotten cheaper financially, but it has gotten much more expensive yeah. psychologically, spiritually. Mm-hmm. In every other way, right? There's no way you can put a value on the cost of divorce. Mm-hmm. It's it's extremely harmful. Yeah, it's. I right, gotta stop. All right, so we're coming down to it. So, ah! what did you put in the comment section? What uh, what have you learned? So, I know many times you you watch this stuff, or I watch other podcasts and things, and you catch more than uh, you. More is caught than taught sometimes. Yeah, yeah. So specifically, you may hear certain words, but you may learn something that comes out maybe in the sentence structure and how we're talking about it and how we're referring to uh, families, things like that. What have you learned? Our mistakes. Right, yeah, and we've all made them. And so what have you learned? Put it in the comments section below. Uh, have you learned that some people might need to go into politics? Uh, <laughs> that That's something, you know. Uh, should we just bash all politicians or do we step up to the plate and do do the right thing? Not all politicians are liars and thieves. Well, I see you look at, at early American history where ministers were also Absolutely. politicians. Absolutely. They Most opened the church for the for the meeting and they would, yeah. you know, I'm going to be the governor or whatever. Yeah. A lot of them were ministers. And then we said, you know, let's get out of that because that's getting dirty. Yeah. And then we said, let's never go into that. And then we, we, we relocated that to... Social engineers to the point where now we all we can do is complain about our government. That's right. Very, <laughs> so what have we? True. What have we brought ourselves to brought ourselves. by stepping out? Yeah. So it's just something I, to think about. You know, like twenty percent of our founding fathers, uh, the American founding fathers, was, was ministers. Yeah. It's crazy. I, there are some good ones out there. I have noticed. Like I, I'm on Twitter. I like Mike okay. Huckabee. Mike Huckabee. He was a Baptist. He was actually an ordained pastor. Right. Baptist pastor. He was. Um. What's the guy in Florida? Marco Rubio. Mm-hmm. Every day, if you follow Marco Rubio, every day, first thing in the morning, he posts a, a scripture. He convicted me a while back. Not legally, but he convicted me because of that. So, yeah, there there are some good men out there. And I don't think that they're perfect. And women. Men. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm not very good at some of this stuff. But, uh, yeah, there there is some good politicians out there. We have actually... A couple of apostolic politicians, one up in Arkansas and one over in California, right. and they're they're up there in state government. I'm trying to think. Doug, what's his last name? Uh, Doug, tall guy, fairly skinny, uh, in national politics. He's a congressman. Really? Doug, he's a military chaplain, mm-hmm. pastor, mm-hmm. or was a pastor, I believe. Now he's a congressman. I didn't know that. Yeah. He got a, his master's in divinity, and then he got a law degree. Good. Pretty good. neat guy. That yeah. is awesome. Somebody will put it in there, but first name's Doug. Yeah. I forget. Yeah. Anyways, thank you for joining us. I know we we're cutting it right to the end, but you've been watching Pastor Talk. This is something we've been doing every Tuesday evening at 8 o'clock, and this was episode number 17. We may take a break from it at some point. Who knows? But uh, let us know what you've been thinking, what you learned from uh, this discussion tonight, and if there's anything that you want to uh, hear us talk about, feel yeah. free to let us know. And um, I appreciate you all, love you, and hope you have a great night, and God bless.